This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E dot com. Hey everybody, listen up. I got I got mega huge news. Meat Eater Live is heading back out on the road. That's right. Join me and the crew talking Clay Newcomb, Cal, Yanni, Spencer's gonna be there. Phil, Phil the engineer is gonna be there. Meat Eater Live headed back out. Now, when you get every ticket, okay, every ticket you buy, you get a signed copy of our new Meat Eater Outdoor Cookbook. This tour is celebrating the release of the book. Buy a ticket, get a signed copy, Meat Eater Outdoor Cookbook, Wild Game Recipes for the Grill, Smoker, Camp Stove, and Camp Fire, which I'll point out is a $38 value. Here's where we're going to go. April 23rd, the Mesa Art Center in Mesa, Arizona. April 24, the Balboa Theater in San Diego. April 25, the Grove in Anaheim, California. April 27, the Crest Theater in Sacramento. April 29, The Union in Salt Lake City. April 30, The Egyptian in Boise. May 1, The Wilma Theater in Missoula. May 2, The Bing Crosby Theater in Spokane, Washington. May 4, Revolution Hall in Portland, Oregon. And May 5, the last day of the tour, Pantages Theater in Tacoma, Washington. For tickets and more information, visit the events page at the Meat Eater. Dot com. If we're not coming to your neck of the woods and you still want to get your hands on a signed copy of our new Meat Eater Outdoor Cookbook, go to signedoutdoorcookbook.com or check out Barnes & Noble online. Hope to see you at the show. Okay, everybody, joined today by Jeff Foxworthy, uh, who I, I've I've wanted to have you on for forever. We talked about it years ago. But you don't, I had to come to you. <laughs> Look, I have spent my entire <laughs> life on the road. It's like, it was kind of a race between you and Rogan. I know, because, and you won't even travel to go on Joe's no, show. No, I won't travel. Joe's like, come, I really want to talk to you. Come do the show. I want to talk about hunting. And I'm like, dude, I don't want to fly to Austin. All the way know? over to Austin. <laughs> well, but <laughs> I've spent four decades on airplanes in hotel rooms. I so, got you. Yeah. Comedian. So it actor. worked. You I, came I to finish, my farm. No, I didn't. I want to finish my intro. Then I want to get right. into what you were talking about. Hope it's good. Well, here, here, here the problem, problem is Corinne wrote the intro. Oh, okay. But uh, on the subject of Corinne, our, our producer Corinne, as everyone knows, is Chinese and Jewish, and, and Jeff's already got half act. That's just such a weird combination. I'm not going to tell anybody the jokes. I don't want to ruin them. He's got half act. What was the last one? Uh, the, the only place that you can go to somebody's house and eat mushu matzo balls. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. See, you see where it's going. <laughs> Comedian, actor, author, television host, and writer. The reason I was criticizing Corinne's introduction, she said last night, do you think we should have an introduction for Jeff? I'm like, yeah, make one. But she only put, she put perhaps your greatest work last. And you probably don't realize it was your greatest work, which is the incomplete deer hunter. Oh, my God. So I'd like to say Jeff Foxworthy is the creator of The Incomplete Deer Hunter and a comedian, actor, author, television host, and writer. He's been nominated for a Grammy, has a book of poems for kids. New York Times bestseller. Is a member of the Blue Collar Comedy Tour with Larry the Cable Guy, who I had no idea his name wasn't Larry. Did you not? No. You need to get out more. You've no. spent way too much time in the woods. Uh, you were talking today about how he's played golf for 30 years and never got never any got better. Never got one stroke better. <laughs> never. It's, it's not even humanly possible. Uh, comedy specials on Netflix, The Good Old Days. Um, and then, of course, what well, she has at the end, The Incomplete Deer Hunter. And I want to – just another thing uh, of your many funny jokes. One of my favorites is – in one of your records, I can't remember which one, you're talking about the impulse to, I thought of this being in here, people's impulse to dress taxidermy up. 
Yeah, well, that's what you don't do. And and you were commenting that sometimes people put so much stuff on their deer mounts that it looks like they got killed at Mardi Gras. Yeah. Oh yeah, they have like beads around them and sunglasses and. You know, Christmas time, you put a little Santa hat on them. But they, yeah, a lot of them, they stick a cigarette in their mouth and beads on them. And Dude, I laughed so hard. Shot, shot him at Mardi that. Gras. Yeah. Uh, man, let me do. Here, here's the thing. I didn't know, like, I got one thing I want to talk about. All right. Because we do listener feedback. Okay. Which I'm cutting it all. All right. Because I want to get to your story that you were just talking about, about how musicians got it made and comedians don't. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you one thing, because you might have made this mistake. This is just one. I, I, I hate to exclude the audience, so I want to do one listener feedback. And lo, we like to focus on criticisms. Okay. Excuse my pedantry. This is from a guy named Alex. What's a pedantry? Uh, like teachy. Okay. Preachy. Right? Pedantry. Anytime someone starts out a letter with excuse my pedantry, you know. You're in trouble. Excuse my pedantry. But I have noticed Steve committing a pet peeve of mine that seems common to most writer types. And it pains me not to point it out. He has on multiple occasions, most recently in episode 514, used the phrase, reached a crescendo, to describe an apex or climax. You following? I'm look. I'm so glad the criticism is against you. I I just breathed a sigh of relief. So go. So it'd be like around midnight. Yeah. It reached a crescendo of noise. Yeah. What should it be? Well. However, a crescendo is a rising action. It means to increase volume, crescendo, from piano quiet to forte loud. It's a musical term. Sure. In this example, the forte volume would be the peak of intensity. It's not the crescendo. The You're, crescendo well, is the technically, rise. he's right, yeah. The inverse of crescendo would be to decrescendo. My realm of expertise is only musical, but my understanding is that the same holds true of the word in non-musically related Italian as well. Italian. I appreciate <laughs> I added that. that. Yeah. I added that. Yeah. Well, that's what I say <laughs> about me aging is I have eclipsed the apex of my splendor. Got it. Which means, you know, that you're I'm, on the decrescendo. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the decrescendo. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I want to get I want to get back to the thing you were talking about a minute ago and saying that uh, you were telling me before Phil turned the machine on that musicians got it made because a musician can have four hits. Yeah. And then spend the rest of his life playing those four songs. And people are going to come out. Yeah, you'd be 90 years old. They're going to come to hear those four songs. They might like your other stuff, but they're those there four for that. songs. Yeah. A comedian, it's the opposite. Is You know, back in the day, you did a record or you did a CD, uh, and uh, you record a special, and people go, oh, that was funny. What have you got that's new? Yeah. So as a comic... It would be like a musician going, I'm never playing the hits again. I'm going to go write a new album. And once I release that album, I'll never play that again. And that's mm-hmm. what a comic does, is, which is one of the most agonized. After 41 years of doing stand-up, it's like I did that last special. And I'm like, okay, yeah. starting over from you can't scratch. Rest on it now anymore. I'm back to the club with 30 people in it, note cards in my hand going, is, <laughs> is this funny? Is this funny? Yep. Is this funny? And that's how a comic works. Their, their writer, David Remnick, once observed, he was profiling Bruce Springsteen, but he observed that he was talking about the Rolling Stones, how a band can eventually become its own cover band. Yeah. You know, but you're right. You, you, a comic can't do that. No. Springsteen. People um, can't be like, I just want to wait till he does the one bit and then we'll go home. Yeah. <laughs> no. They they don't want to get, they've heard that. No. But I got to, I got to meet uh, Bruce one time and my question for him was, I said, how as a 20 year old, could you write lyrics like young girls sitting on the hood of a Dodge drinking warm beer in the soft summer rain? I said, nobody 20 should be able to write that. Mm. And he goes, you know, I just, I wanted to be writing stuff. I wasn't going to be embarrassed singing 30 years later. <laughs> I'm like, 
mission accomplished. That's a good. Yeah. That's a good approach. Yeah. Uh, tell everybody where we're at right now. We're at my farm, uh, about an hour south of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my. If I'm not working, this is my sanctuary. This is this is my happy place. Uh, I always say when I go through the gate, I'm no longer Jeff Foxworthy. I'm just Jeff. Mm -hmm. Cheapest labor on the farm. I, I will work all day long with a bag of jerky and three waters and get on a tractor and um, happy as a clam. Uh, you were telling me earlier how people are surprised. Some people are surprised that, that you wanted land and not like Jerry Seinfeld wanted cars. <laughs> well, like well, you observed that a tractor costs more than a lot of his cars. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like when, when I did my sitcom, it was, we filmed right next to Seinfeld. And so Jerry and I had parking places, um, uh, next to each other and he had like an aircraft hangar full of porsches so every day he'd come in with a different porsche i had a pickup truck i literally went to beverly hills dodge and i said <laughs> I, I want one of the new ram trucks and the guy goes to drive <laughs> he goes we don't sell those here i had to go out somewhere front. so i would pull into with my pickup truck in the spot and jerry would wheel in with his porsche and get out and go good morning loser and you know <laughs> like the dude in the pickup truck but yeah i didn't i mean that wasn't my thing i didn't care about car i wasn't a car guy i wanted no. i wanted a farm i wanted land and so that's where my car money but i did tell jerry i said you really need to come film an episode of comedians drinking coffee and tractors because some of my tractors cost more than your Porsches. Yeah, so. be comedians getting beer and tractors. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think he would love a tractor or a bulldozer and just feel the joy of pushing a tree over or something, you know. How, how did, uh, you have a property because you like to hunt. Yeah. And it's, it's beautifully managed. It's, you manage it as a wildlife. It's yeah. It's like you manage for wildlife, deer in particular, but you manage for wildlife. Uh, when you were growing up, what was your what was your understanding of deer hunting spots? Like, what kind of ground did you guys hunt as a kid? Well, it's funny. Like growing up in Georgia, we didn't have deer when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. We we but you squirrel hunted, you quail hunted, you rabbit hunted, and it was usually on some relative's farm. Yeah. Everybody had small farms back then. So, and my dad didn't have a a bird dog, so he would buy me briar bridges and then go, hey, get down there and walk through there and. I was the dog. I flushed what, what the was your dad? What did your dad do for a living? My dad grew up on a farm, but he worked at IBM. Uh, oh, he did? Yeah. They, he, had a, he was a smart dude. But we'd go back to these little farms, and that's how I learned to hunt. Was like, I remember being four or five years old and going squirrel hunting and learning, you got to sit still. You can't talk. You can't move. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it was quail hunting. Then it was dove hunting. And then it became deer hunting. Uh, I, I hunted... By the time I was a teenager in Georgia, I hunted two years before I saw a deer. Now, that was dedication. You deer hunted two years before you saw a deer. Yeah. Getting up every weekend. Going through the motions. Getting up Saturday morning, uh -huh. Saturday evening, Sunday morning. Never saw a deer. Uh, and it took me, I think, three years. And I finally shot a little five-point buck, which I thought. That, that's the one he showed me. Well, no, that was the second one. That was the eight-point buck, which had a basket rack like this that I literally, I, I think I didn't clean it for three days. I kept driving it through town because I was pretty sure it was the state record, and I wanted everybody to say, I saw it. I saw it on the tailgate of his truck. Uh, you know, but you only know what you know. I, I knew nothing about deer hunting. Uh -huh. I, would, I would go, like, behind grocery stores and get pallets and – go to construction sites and get two by fours and I would make my own stands and get like railroad spikes and go up a tree with two by fours and put a pallet up there. Never thought about the wind, never thought about, is there a food source or a bedding? Probably source. never thought about a safety it harness. Was, no safety harness. <laughs> ha! No, but never thought about any of that yeah. stuff and climb up and, you know, after three years, one of the steps would rot and you'd drop. I mean, it's a wonder we're still here, but, uh, but I knew I loved it. I knew I loved being out in the woods by myself, it, which is kind of crazy because like on my dad's farm, me and two friends would leave in the morning with a 22 and a 12 gauge shotgun and take off through the woods. We had no cell phone. Nobody knew where we were. We mm -hmm. didn't know where we were. 
you know, we just go explore the woods and end up on a road and walk back home. And it was just a totally different time. I've told you a couple of times today that I had no idea that here in Georgia, you guys' deer numbers were so bad that they actually brought in deer. They had to restock, yeah, in the yeah. 50s. I mean, there's a lot of areas where it got bad, but I, I just was not aware that they had to do like a, that they had to do a white-tailed deer reintroduction in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah, it did it during the 50s. It's like I told you as a kid. Yeah. Never saw a deer. Um, and we're lucky here at the farm because most of the deer they brought into Georgia, they brought from Texas. In our particular area, they came down from Wisconsin, so our deer were kind of bigger horned and bigger bodied and this just a, a real good portion of the state to hunt in. When when you were little, what kind of uh, you you you've done a lot of comedy about hunting and, and and sort of like parodies on hunting. When you were little, were you were you aware of any kind of like hunting videos and stuff? Like, were you going out and buying VHS tapes, the the instructional hunting content? D- dude, I had no idea. So when I was a kid, I would save my allowance and I would buy comedy records. Bill Cosby, Flip Wilson, Jerry Clower, you know, and I'd memorize them and I'd go to school and I could do the whole album. <laughs> and so, you know, I was the funny kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I never, you know, hunting was hunting. And I remember the first time I was probably 30 that I saw a real tree hunting video, a deer hunting video. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, people, other people can experience deer hunting. Of course, it was way bigger deer than I ever had seen, yeah. you know, but but it kind of led to, and you mentioned this in the intro, part of hunting, th- there's that solitary part that's really good, but there's also that communal part that mm-hmm. you get in a deer camp, not when you're out actually hunting, but in the camp where it's a very social thing and there's a lot of laughter going on. And so I thought, well, if guys are watching videos of hunts, why wouldn't they watch funny videos too? And so I came up with the incomplete deer hunter. Somebody asked me a while back, they said, who did you write those? I went, right. <laughs> yeah, no, we were, <laughs> we were in the woods with deer suits we had made going, what if we do this, this, and this? But I thought, and, and it was it was a crazy idea. We sold millions oh. of those. Dude, but but it's like maybe you didn't write them. But there's a lot of uh, you know. I'll, this is the thing I wanted to ask you about. Anyways, there's just, there, there's like laughing at your culture from the inside and yeah. laughing from the outside. And this yeah. is something you know intimately well. Like yeah, your whole expertise is laughing from the inside. Right? Well, I'll give you a great example, like. So you grew up in Michigan, Mm -hmm. right? And so I was the kid when I started comedy, I wore jeans, I wore boots, I drove a truck and I was, I, I was just the outdoor kid, but I'm the comedian now in the clubs and I'm up in Michigan and it was like November and I'm like, man, I ought to be sitting in a tree in the morning. I, you know, it's the middle of the road. I need to be in a tree and. They were kidding me. I was playing right outside Detroit, a little town called La- Lavonia. Oh, yeah. And uh, they were kid- we were sitting around, and they were going, Foxworthy, you're nothing but an old redneck from Georgia. Well, the club that we were playing in was attached to a bowling alley that had valet parking. <laughs> and I said, if you don't think you have rednecks in Michigan, go look out the window. People are valet parking <laughs> at the bowling alley. <laughs> and I went back to the hotel that night and I didn't think it was going to be a hook. I didn't think it was going to be a book or t-shirts. I just thought maybe this is funny material. And I wrote 10 ways how to tell how you might be a redneck. And I went back the next night and just tried them as stand up. And not only were people laughing, they were pointing at each other. Well, every one of them was things my family had done. Uh You know, if your front porch collapses and kills more than three dogs, that was my (laughs) uncle Bob's house. When you pulled up in the driveway, the whole bottom of the house just erupted with dogs. Uh, If you have a complete set of salad bowls and they all say cool whip on the side, (laughs) that's my sister. It's nothing but butter tubs, cool whip tubs and jelly glasses. So, I wasn't laughing at somebody. I'm laughing with, you know. Yeah. And that's kind of 
always been my comedy. My my template is is I feel like if if I think something or my wife says something or my family does something, I'm going to trust other people are thinking and yep. saying and doing the same thing. The, that 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 the one that works is because there's an expertise of the subject matter, you know. Yeah. And I'm like laugh about your incomplete deer hunter thing. Um, is when you guys have the deer suits on, and the deer kind of like coaching all the other deer about Coach Buck and Coach yeah, Buck. like this year's <laughs> game plan. Yeah. And there's like very sort of like specific references where the coach is telling the other deer. He's like, when all you does and little bucks come out in the field. Don't look back. When I come out in the field, yeah. <laughs> Don't just, tell them I'm coming, yeah. yeah. But that was all experience. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like you're, like, you're watching it like, no, these dudes actually hunt because no one would ever, like, ever. If an outsider was goofing on rednecks and goofing on deer hunters, they would never know that little bit of body language. Yeah. Where a hunter's like, there's something in the woods still because those deer keep looking back in there. <laughs> and that's what I tell young comics. I said, talk about what you know about. Uh-huh. Uh, it's like when I wrote 10 redneck jokes, I thought, well, if I can write 10, can I write 50? And then I wrote 50, I'm like, can I write 100? And I got like 300 of them. I sent them to 14 different publishers and got rejected. Oh, you did? Yeah, rejected by the first 14. And I sent it to the 15th, and he called me, and he said, come in, let's talk. And he said, uh, "He said I think this is funny. He said, how does $1,500 sound? Steve, I thought he was asking me for 1500 bucks. And, <laughs> and so I'm like, because uh, I didn't have 1500 bucks. And, I, and he goes, no, 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 we'll pay you. I'm like, hell yeah, let's do it, you know. <laughs> and I remember asking him, I said, how many of these do you think will sell? How many books? And he said, oh, I bet we sell 5,000 of them. I think we sold 4 million of them, you know, oh, because. No Who was the publisher? Longstreet Press, but a small publisher in Atlanta. But, but from doing comedy, I'd been to all 50 states. I didn't hang in L.A. and New York. I was going everywhere in between. And I knew L.A. and New York were the media centers, but I also came to know the people living in the country and, and. From what I observed, I'm like, you know, 30 minutes outside of any major city, we're all the same. I and mean, we may have a little different accent, mm -hmm. but we're all hunting and we're all fishing and we're all growing gardens and we're all, you know, got that. My definition of redneck is glorious absence of sophistication. You know, that's all it is. <laughs> and I knew there was a market there, which is why we did the blue collar comedy tour. When they did the Kings of Comedy Atlanta was one of the first stops, and in the paper, in an article about it, it said that it was a show for the urban hip audience. Mm. And I thought, I've been to every state. There's a lot of people that aren't urban, and they're not hip. Yeah. And, and I called Bill Ingvall, and I said, we need to do a show for everybody that this doesn't apply to. And he laughed and said, what would you call it? And I'm like, hell, I don't know. Call it the Blue Collar, Blue Collar Comedy Tour. Yeah. And we were going to do it for three weeks. And we did it, the first one, for three years. I mean, it was just, it just hit a nerve, you know. Have you always planned, or have you always, when you're uh, touring and doing all those shows and all that, were you always trying to schedule around being able to hunt and fish and stuff? Well, or did you sometimes just have to eat it and be like, I'm not going to do anything outdoors because I'm going to like, while the fire's burning hot, I'm just going to go and, yeah, and do and my the, business. Well, Back in the club days, because most clubs were like Tuesday through Sunday, I had eight years in a row. I did 500 shows a year at least. And you're going, well, there's only 365 days. Yeah. But you're doing two shows on Friday night, three shows on Saturday night. If you were in a, you might be bouncing from club to club. And I would just keep note because I wanted, I wanted to be on Johnny Carson. And I thought the only way I'm going to do this is kind of the Malcolm Gladwell theory. I've got to do it. 10,000 times to become an expert at it. And, uh, and my goal was everybody said it takes you 10 years to be a good enough comedian to be on Carson. And I thought I'll do it in half. I'm going to work so by hard. Doubling, I'll do it by doubling half. your nights. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, it actually took me five years and two months, but I did it. <laughs> and, uh, so then I didn't, I didn't do anything but do comedy. Um, but then once I started 
moving from clubs to like theaters and things like that. Then yeah, I, when, you, when, it, when you say a club, <laughs> you're, that's 100 people, 200 people. Yeah, 100 people, 200 people. Yeah. Um, and when you say a theater, it's 1,000, 3,000. Yeah, up to four or 5,000. Okay. Um, but the great thing about theaters, and that kind of happened because of the albums. People became aware of you, and then they would, they would come. Well, theaters were more Friday and Saturday which was great because it was about the time I had kids so I could be home during the week and I was just gone on the weekend doing shows. Got it. Um, then I could start to, to get back into hunting and fishing. In fact, when I did, are you smarter than a fifth grader? I had it in my contract that I could film 11 months of the year, but I couldn't film the month of November. Oh. And I had an, an LA attorney come up to me and say, why? I don't understand. Why can't you film in November? <laughs> And I said, because it's the rut. And he was like, the what? The what? I'm like, dude, it's the rut. I'm not hunting. I mean, I'm not filming during the rut. I'm going to be home. And uh, so I may be the only idiot in L.A. that had that in there. Has of. that in there. Yeah. Do you ever try to go hit? Do you ever try to go somewhere and be trying to get out in the morning with people you know and hit little things? Like hit the morning turkey hunt and then make it to yeah, a show? Yeah, it was just always hard because you couldn't travel with guns. uh uh-huh. And, you know, and like back in the day, you do a show on Friday night. Well, you walk off stage, say you were in Michigan, where you're the next night you may be in Kansas City. So you're up at 5 a.m. to catch the first flight to fly to Kansas City, which you get there at 10 or 11. Well, your day's kind of shot. So yeah. it was just hard. I know that feeling. You know yeah. how you would do 500 shows a year? Yeah. I'd do maybe six to eight. Yeah, and uh, so I have a level of expertise here. But and I know that it, even then, you always like as you're planning it, you're thinking about, man, I'm going to hunt turkeys in every one of those locations. <laughs> yeah, and you <laughs> like just never not, have the time to do it. it and yours out. were different. Like when I watch your shows, like for me, I told my wife, I said, "You love to travel because when you get somewhere, you open your suitcase and you open it for a week." I said, "I'm opening my suitcase every day and packing uh-huh. it back up." Cause you're in a different city every night. And, but like with your shows, when you're going to these remote places, hell, you're going to sheep hunt. You're gone two weeks. Oh, you know? that kind of show. Yeah. I was referring to doing like doing live shows, which would be yeah. a very small handful of, Oh no, it, it's, uh, your trips were long, trips. long trips. Yeah. yeah. No, you really get like, uh, doing that kind of, doing that kind of lifestyle, especially when we were making a lot of shows, man, you get like a really deep immersion into a lot of different spots, Yeah, which is just completely like not at all similar to what you're talking about with like the turn and burn and kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Did you, did you start to formulate an idea of like, at, at what point in your life did you start thinking that at some point I'm going to slow down and enjoy myself more? Yeah. And, and what will that look like? Like, when did you indulge yourself with that, you know, with that vision? Um, Because I look now, I feel like you got, I feel like I'm, when I'm here, I'm like, man, this guy's got it made. I know, but I, like out burning, last, last out weekend, I, the woods and, last weekend I was in Michigan on Friday night, Minnesota on Saturday night. So I still, um, I still enjoy what I do, but I've slowed down. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I probably do. 40 or 50 concerts a year now as Got opposed it. to hundreds because uh, I want to enjoy my grandkids. Yeah. Uh, you know, yesterday I'm riding around on tractors and skid steers with my two and a half year old grandson. That's, that's my joy in life. That's why I, I always said I didn't want to live to work. I wanted to work to live. Unfortunately, I was born with a work, with a work ethic. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I don't want to sit around. I, you know, my mom's like, you need to slow down. I said, I just wasn't born with that brain. Mm-hmm. I can't just sit on the couch. I, I want to go do something. I want to go see something, learn something. Did your uh, Did your folks think you were crazy for what you wanted to do? Yeah. Well, did, I, they, did they try to discourage you? Like, he'll never do that. You know, well, I blew up. I, my folks divorced early. So my dad had a really good job working at IBM, but my granddad was a fireman. When you say early, how old are you? Like eight or nine. Yeah. Uh, How well did you understand what was going on? Well, back I was the only kid I knew that had divorced parents. It was, you know, that it sucked because you know, I I wanted my dad there, but mm-hmm. uh, 
but I love my grandparents. My granddad, bless his heart, was a fireman, so he worked one day and had two off, and he was fishing the two he was off, and he would take me. Got it. You know, great granddad, which was one of my goals in life. I'm like, I want to be a really good granddad. But uh, I, everybody I knew, they were blue collar. They worked for a living. So even though I was attracted to comedy, it never occurred to me that that was a possibility. Yeah, you probably hadn't met a comic. No. They were just on TV. and um, But I was the funny guy. I, I actually, I worked in a grocery store and I worked at a hotel and then I got a job. I think my dad, because I flunked out of college after three years, um, I think my dad thought I was going to end up being a ne'er-do-well. So I think he got one of his friends to call and give me a job at IBM, st- uh, entry level. <laughs> uh, I was working dispatch and then later on I was, I carried a tool bag and fixed machines. Um, but I was the funny guy at work. I was the guy that was in the break room doing impersonations of the boss. And then you would turn around. The boss would be in the doorway. I was that guy. So I wasn't on the, uh, crescendo to be oh, yeah, to, you yeah, know, no. to the top. Uh, <laughs> and a bunch of guys I worked with entered me in a comedy competition, not an amateur night, a competition for working comedians called the great Southeastern laugh off. They entered me in and I'm like, Oh, crap. I got to write material. So I, I wrote five minutes about my family. I went down. I won the contest the first what, time. What, I was, was, the, what was the material? Um, it was why I lived in Sarasota, Florida, and I talked about it being it was God's waiting room because everybody there was like 90 years got old. It, got it, yeah. Then I did a bit about <laughs> dads. Dads, when everybody else cuts their toenails, they put them in the trash. Dads leave theirs in the ashtray in the den for the (laughs) whole family to come observe and admire. The crazy thing is my wife used to act, and she had just done a TV show with a comedian, and she was there that night rooting for him in the competition. So I met my career, and I met my wife five minutes apart. You stole his fan. Same night. Yeah. Were they romantically involved? No. No, in fact, he's, he and his wife are two of our best friends to this day. But what's the odds of finding your career and your wife five minutes apart, same night? I guess low. Yeah, low. And But I knew Well, it. hold on a minute. I take that back a little bit. Cause, when I sold my first book, I went, I had never been to New York, sold my first book, went to have a meeting. I sold it to Miramax probably heard of those fellers bob and harvey weinstein i have sold their company flew to new york to meet the people that bought my book and in that meeting met my wife did you not from new york did you know when you met her did you did you because i no uh -uh. so i met Uh -uh. my wife on a tuesday night we went out on a saturday and an hour into the date i went oh crap i'm gonna marry this girl oh really an hour into the first date. And she was the only one that was saying to me, you could do this. You, she said to me, she said, you are so creative. If you sit in a cubicle the rest of your life, you're going to have a miserable life. You're going to mm. explode. You need to do something creative. Is your wife redneck? No, she's from New Orleans. Uh, Does that make you not a redneck? I don't understand. No, they've got a lot of oh. them down there. <laughs> But like, instead of, cause in my mind, I, I, think I, don't, she, I don't think of that as incompatible. No, they, they're very compatible. Uh, cause she has family in other parts of Louisiana that will eat things. The FBI can't identify. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just, uh, but I think she really thought she was going to pull me up to her level. And instead I just, I got to drug, drug her down to me. Well. But, but she, it was like the first person that got me. You know uh, what I mean? She I was like, and so I thought, hell, I could do this. And, um, so I quit my job. I, and I tell my kids, I'm like, like the, at that point, well, I went, I did amateur night for like six months and little gigs around town, but I knew by then I loved it. And, uh, what was the first money you were making at it? <laughs> I mean, not like, I mean, All right, what so, was the first like, uh, helpful, usable amount of money? So. December the 4th, 1984, I'm, they had amateur night before the regular show. Stephen Wright's the headliner. 
And he found me in the club. He had watched Amateur Night. And he came up and he told me, he said, you need to be doing this. You should be a comic. And with the, which kind of reinforced what my wife said. And so I went in the next day and I told my boss, I'm like, I'm quitting IBM. And, uh, <laughs> My mother, when I told my mother I had quit, her, well, that's right. You were supposed. I was her supposed first to be, question I was supposed to be was, asking about your parents' perception. Yeah, I'm, I got there eventually. Uh, my mom's first question was, "Are you on the dope?" <laughs> I'm not sure what the dope was. Are you on the dope? We can get you help. And I'm like, no. I said, but I think I can do this, and I don't want to be sitting around when I'm 60 going, "What if I tried that?" And I tell my kids, I said, you need some hold your nose and jump moments in your life. And so my first real gig was New Year's Eve um, of 84 with Sinbad. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I think I was making. Oh, that, that was what year? 84. Okay. So I think yeah. I was making like 32 grand a year at IBM and I had health and dental insurance. My first year of comedy, 85, first full year, I did 406 shows and I made $8,300 <laughs> for the year, which is like 20 bucks a show. So at that point, man, you've given, like at that point, at that volume, you've really given up a lot of normal life. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. You're not doing anything. When I would go out to do the week at the comedy club, my, my wife would give me 30 bucks to live on for the week. And that was gas money and food money. And you were hoping the club gave you a free meal. If a club served food, a lot of times the comics could eat. Uh, we used to roll pennies. And when we had enough, we'd go to the movies. That was our dates. <laughs> really? You live like that? Huh? Oh yeah, dude. Well, no money. So, so broke. I, I left Atlanta one time. I had a gig at a comedy club that was in a Holiday Inn in Sarasota, Florida. I drove down there, and when I got there, the guy said— Oh, did you say the—where was the gig? Sarasota, Florida. But in a Holiday Inn? In a Holiday Inn. Their little nightclub there. And But the deal was they, <laughs> they gave you a hotel room for the week while you did this. And when I got there, the guy said, dude, he said, last <laughs> night was our last night. We're, we're not making money. We're, we closed. And I'm like, so you're out of business. <laughs> Well, I just driven nine hours. Yeah, yeah. I went in the lobby bathroom and peed and bought a Coke and got back in the car. So I've driven nine hours and now I'm turning around driving back home. But I haven't got paid. I don't have a credit card. And I'm like, God, I hope I got enough money to get home for gas. And I stop in Macon, Georgia at about three in the morning and I'm digging for change underneath the car seat. You know, oh, we got 40 cents. Let me put that in gas in the car. And I got to South Atlanta where I grew up and the red light's on. I'm like, I'm not going to make it home. So I pull off the interstate into a gas station and I'm trying to figure out. I don't even have a quarter to call my wife. Uh, and a guy I went to high school with pulled up to get gas. And I went over to him and I said, dude, I'm so embarrassed. But I left home this morning without my wallet. I didn't want to tell him I was that broke. Mm-hmm. I said, can I borrow five bucks? And he's like, yeah, oh, hell yeah. And so I got home. Years later, he came to my concert. <laughs> and he goes, I remember loaning you. And I said, dude, I was so broke. I had no money to get home. I said, let me pay you back. And he's like, nope. I want you to owe it to me because it's a much better story this way. <laughs> yeah. And the son of it still hasn't paid yeah, you back. Yeah, he still hasn't paid me back. <laughs> that's, that's, that's incredible, though, that you went through all that. I mean, it's great that you did but it. But looking back, yeah. it, it's... It, it was good. It made. Oh, I think yeah, it I made think it's me important, man. Better. I had a hunger to get better at it. You know. Mm -hmm. You know, people say that comics have like a. There's like a, a lot of them are chasing a. It's got to be fueled somewhere, right? Yeah, I, I always buy that, heard. There's like a. There's, there's like some sort of demon that needs to be, slay. You know, or, or, or else you're not funny. You know what I mean? Like like. If everything's just gravy all the time, you don't get a chance to be funny. Yeah, I always heard they're they're laughing on the outside, crying on the inside. Sure, but I think it's like human beings. We're we're all different. Um, I think I was probably affected by my dad leaving mm. because I could make my dad laugh when I saw him. Well, that was 
you the approval. Got it. So it probably made me work at being funnier. Mm -hmm. But I was wired this way. I came from a funny family. I was wired creative. Uh, part of the reason that I flunked out of college was I was going to Georgia Tech, which was an engineering school, and that wasn't my strength. I remember taking an English class there and writing a story about deer hunting. Oh, you did? And the English teacher goes, have you ever thought about being a writer? Maybe you're not an engineer. Maybe you should be a writer. I remember being in high school and I had no money to buy my girlfriend a birthday present. I saw there was a speech co contest at the Elks Lodge that paid 50 bucks. <laughs> I wrote a speech, went down there and won, you know, <laughs> hey, taking my girlfriend to Red Lobster, baby. Here we go. So uh, so what happened with flunking out of college? Yeah, I was at the wrong place. I It, it, it wasn't my gift, you uh -huh. know. And I didn't know what my gift was. But from where I stand now, like God made me this way. I see the funny in things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I don't get mad or I don't get sad, but I always look for the funny in it. And I, I do believe it's a gift. And I think I'm a writer and any great comic is a writer. Mm -hmm. You just have to have that brain and, and, and you're a writer. We don't do it necessarily because it's fun it ain't fun no i don't enjoy it. i don't I, enjoy the act if people have a hard time with that doing it is not like like doing it's not fun Th there's a writer ian frazier and he he said when when he was little he pictured being a writer he pictured writers sitting there and they're typing and they're kind of chuckling to themselves you know no. and, <laughs> and then only later do you realize that it, it's just like it's just doing it is not enjoyable it's, it's not, only enjoyable but, the minute but, you stand up. The minute the, you stand the up, the finished it's great. product. Yeah. When you look back and you go, "Yeah, man." Yeah. Now, all right. Let me ask you a question because I actually asked Bruce Springsteen this. Like, I have a pad next to my bed. Mm -hmm. I've had it for thirty years with a pen on it, and I can write in the dark. But so, because you always think you're going to remember it, and you never do. So I've learned, like, write. Like something about as your body's relaxing to go to sleep, ideas start coming. Mm. And I've learned to just write a sentence where I can remember it in the morning. But I also have a pad next to, on my bathroom counter. I bet 60% of the things I think of are in the shower. Oh. And so I get out of the shower. And, and I actually ask Springsteen, I said, where do you write the most? Oh, no, I write a lot of stuff in the shower, man. Oh, oh like, really? Oh, yeah. So there must be. When I'm driving in the shower and right before I'm going to bed is usually those times. There's a, there's a, there's a, a band I like a bit, uh, trampled by turtles. They have the, great name. Yeah. The, the, the singers, this guy, Dave Simonette, and he's really good lyrically. And the other night he left his, uh, he accidentally left his little notebook at my house. It's sitting on my counter right now. And I keep wanting to look in that little notebook, but I can't bring myself to look in there. Because I feel like it'd be like a betrayal. Kind of is. But I'm real curious about it. For a writer. I have yeah. cracked it. I yeah. look at it, and I think, man, I want to look in that notebook. Yeah. But then I feel like I'd be violating some kind of guest host bond, you know? But, like if I found it on the street, sure. But he left it in my house. See, that's why I so was So we don't real, crack it open. We just look at it. I was interested in doing this with you because you're a weird combo in that you're very capable but you're creative, which are not usually like most really creatives. I know can't tie their shoes, can't mm. fill up their gas tank. And that's kind of normal. I had a dad that pounded all that India. Yeah. He didn't give a lick about the creative. No, part. mine didn't either, yeah. but it was like, if he wrote something. It was on a, it was on graph paper <laughs> Yeah, or on a two by four, you know, that's, exactly. uh, but I think you and I are, have that in common is, we're capable, but we're creative as well. Rogan's like this. So it's a weird mix, mm -hmm. uh, which, cause I'm kind of fascinated by the writer side of you. Mm -hmm. I saw where Steve Martin won a writing award and he said, this means more to me than anything cause writing's hard. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I get it. You know, it's. Well, yeah. Cause you guys get like, like comics, you get known for the performative part, but prior to the performative part, it's the writing part. Do you know? But I'm, a writer just winds up. It's kind of the end of it. You're, you're a writer. It's you know? funny because I'm kind of a physical comic. 
and people will ask me, do you practice in front of a mirror? No, I, I never think about the performance. Do you ever have to watch yourself? I hate to watch myself. Oh, so you don't know what you look like. I cringe. Like when I used to do Johnny Carson and you'd film it like at four or five in the afternoon and you'd come home and, and it would come on. I'd watch the whole show until I came on. Then I'd get up and leave the room. Because I hate the way I talk. I hate the way I look. I did. And my wife would be in the other room going, it's really good. Come watch it. And I'm like, no, I can't. I can't you I hate can't. the way you look. What do you wish you looked like? I don't know. Something different. Uh, Springsteen? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, with comedy, it was always the writing. And, you know, and, it, and it's kind of like, I know when you do it well that the audience thinks, oh, he just walked out here and just thought of this oh yeah but leno i remember when i was still doing amateur nights leno was always so nice to young comics was he very patient and we're sitting at the waffle house and he said your goal should be to write one new minute a week now think about that your goal should be to write one new minute a week it gives you a special every year and well it does (laughs) And and in my mind, I'm thinking, are you out of your mind? I could write 20 or 30 minutes a week. No, he was right. If you can write one minute that a room full of strangers are going to laugh at every time you say it, mm-hmm. over the course of a year, you've got a new, you've got a new album, you've got a new special, you know, whatever it is. And but it that wasn't easy. I mean, you had to be working to get 60 new minutes a year, which was always so sad because you do a special went crap, all that work. Now I've got to start all over. Uh, walk me through how, and uh, the, the, how, uh, uh, the flow of the flow of an idea. Um, if you don't practice in front of a mirror, so you get like an observation that like your wife's butt's cold when she climbs in bed. Yeah. Well, how'd her butt get cold? Yeah. Um, you drive around in your tractor or whatever. And you think about that, and you think that's funny. You never go and and get it, like that. The the perf- it's, it just lives in your head. Then you try it out. Like you never do. Like hey, film me talking about this. So no, I can watch it. it starts with a with a thought, and then I'm like, like if I thought of something, when maybe I think this is funny. Like in you and I were having a conversation. I'd figure out a way to work it into the conversation oh. and to see, and if you laughed, I went, okay, that's a valid thought. And then oh, so I, you try it out. Like you try it out on your buddies without them knowing it. Yeah. And then, so in the early days, I always envisioned it like clay. I would, I would go out there and throw an idea out, say it's five sentences and three of them worked. So I'd keep the three that worked, get rid of the two that didn't. And then the next night I'd try two or three more. And so it was like, adding a little piece mm-hmm. of clay every night and over a, course there. Of, over a course of a month, you've got a new 10 minute bit. Yeah. As I've gotten older, I kind of did the opposite is I would start with the big glob and just go out there and try it, which I don't know why, but everything that didn't work, I'd cut it off and cut it off and just kept. And so in the early days, my bits were two and three minutes long. Now they tend to be 20 and 30 minutes long, right? Really? long pieces when you say a bit you mean like you'll do that you'll spend that time on a subject yeah like having a kidney stone you know (laughs) so like you're not gonna get done with that in two minutes (laughs) no well and and here's my thought if you go to all the trouble to set it up Uh which is the part you're not getting a laugh once you get it set up why not go you gotta harvest dig deep and get like jim gaffigan talking about bacon you uh-huh. know, I'm a comic, and I'm like, how long can you talk about bacon? For two or three minutes. At minute 20 of Gaffigan, I've got my hands in my head going, how can you talk about bacon for 20 minutes? Yep. This is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, That's a good observation. you got to set you got to set the story up. Yeah, but if you've gone to all to that start spinning trouble. Off, and then it yeah. needs to spin off jokes, yeah. Yeah. What uh, When you were, not when you were, because as you meet comics, um. Are you guys always bound, like, do you feel that you're bound to other comics through the comedy, or do you feel like the the sort of political and social differences, do you, I mean, like, do you run into, do you, when you're doing, running into other comics, and like, is it like, you're sort of like the redneck guy from the South, 
and so you're ostracized or is it just that, that comedy brings your whole circle of professional colleagues together? I mean, I think when you're starting out, it's so competitive and everybody's trying to get a hand on the ledge that you're really cutthroat with each other. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing about the redneck jokes, they were one-liners. And so we live in an age where nobody does one-liners, but they were easy to remember. They were easy to retell. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I could do them on the radio and... I could do 10 of them. So there's 10 laughs and people could remember them. They could repeat them, but it was a way for people to remember my name. Mm -hmm. And, but at the height of it, it was three minutes out of an hour and a half show. Yeah. And so for people that thought that was all I did, I'm like, no, you haven't watched me. Mostly what I do is material about my wife and my family and my kids and, but it was a way for them to remember their name. I, I find the longer you do it, you realize it, it's a wonderful job, but it's hard. You, you don't last unless you work hard at it. Mm. Um, it's like, you know, I love to look for arrowheads. If I walk in a guy's house and he's got a display case full of unbroken arrowheads, I knew that took a long time. That took a long, long time to find that many unbroken arrowheads. Same way with a comic. And so you, can you, I, can you, I you come to have metric? a respect for each other. I want to get return to this, but I want to tell you another metric okay. you should consider. Um, how many mountain lions have you seen? That's a metric yeah. for time spent, time spent messing around outside. How many have you seen? Not many. I spent a lot of time messing around outside. Yeah. I think I've, had, I've seen six that weren't being chased by dogs. Well, that's pretty cool. Well, I got a buddy who spends a lot of time outside. Last time I talked to him, he was on like 35 or something. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, I didn't mean to interrupt your chain of thought. I, I but had, I know what you're saying. Like, like, I just had to get stuck back an to elk thing. with a bow one time, and I was trailing him. And uh, Glenn, my farm manager who you met, went back to get us some water and all. And so I just sat down, and when he came back, he goes, dude, there's mountain lion tracks in your footprints. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> my dumb ass is sitting at the bottom of a tree with my bow. You know, it's a wonder I wasn't lunch. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't want to break a chain of thought, but I was just thinking about your awareness of that collection and being like, that is a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. Like you're dedicated. You're good at it. You know? Well, yeah. You know, I, out of everything I've done professionally, the thing that I'm proudest of is I've sold more comedy records than anybody that's ever lived. Is that right? Yep. Corinne should have put that in the damn bio. I know. Nice job, Corinne. So go eat <laughs> some more Mushu matzo balls. So, uh, but, but what that tells me is you had to write a oh, lot. You sold more comedy records than, than Cosby, Carlin, than Eddie and, Murphy's Delirious. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. My first comedy record sold almost 4 million copies. The second one did almost the same. The, the like physical selling, copies. Yeah. Physical. No kidding. CDs man. or albums. Yeah. So, but what that tells me is, I'll tell you what it tells me. Somebody was, was a popular ass comedian. <laughs> well, it means you were working, you were writing, Yeah. you know, and, I mean, I've written like 27 books and invented games. I've been very lucky to do a lot of things creatively, but, but out of everything that tells me you worked at it, you worked, hard. which is, it, it, you know, it's, it's part of me with hunting. I want to do it. I want to do things that aren't easy. Mm -hmm. Like when I was a kid, I just wanted to shoot a deer that had antlers. I just wanted to kill a deer, <laughs> any antler didn't matter. You know, that that's enough, you know? Yeah. 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 And, and, and there's cycles hunters go through. Then you want to shoot a bigger one and you want to shoot a bigger one. And, but you get to a point like, cause I was doing a lot of hunting shows. I was doing hunting shows for real tree and uh, bucks of Tecamani. And I was getting to go places and hunt really cool things and shoot really big deer. And I had a year where I shot a 13 point deer. He's out there in the, in manland out there, huge deer. 
shot him with a gun at mm-hmm. 350 yards. And then I came back to my farm, and my farm manager only bow hunted, and I was starting to play around with that's, it. That's your buddy here? Glenn. Glenn. And the next weekend, I shot a 138-inch deer, but he was Pope and Young with a bow and arrow, and I sat up there, and I just shook. Got and it. I re- could remember being 15 years old. And it, the deer I shot at 350 yards had no idea that I was there. I didn't really have to be that stealth. I was a long way away. Yeah. But the one I shot at 30 yards, that was close and personal. And I and I remember, si- I called my wife. I never call my wife when I shoot. She's cooking dinner back at home. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, I just, I, I, I shot a buck with my bow. And I thought, this is what I want to feel like. This is what I want hunting to feel like. And so I'm like, I'm not doing a gun anymore. I'm going to hunt with a bow. Mm -hmm. I was horrible at it. I mean, it took me two or three years to even get, I messed up. I kept drawing at the wrong time, you know, so you sat there for two hours waiting on a doe to come up and now you draw at the wrong time, spook her and she runs off and you're like, okay, I got to wait till her head's behind a tree. But there was something about wanting to do it the hard way. Yep. And... Once I had started being pretty good at shooting deer with it, I'm like, I want to, I want to go hunt an elk. I want to, but not with a gun. I want to, and then it was a moose. And then it was, I want to hunt it. Like I'd always kind of been fascinated with bears, but I had zero interest in nothing wrong with somebody doing this. I didn't want to shoot one over a barrel of donuts. I wanted to go find a bear and shoot him with my bow. Well, Mm -hmm. I ended up doing that because and I don't know if you ever feel like this, but like I would watch videos of people hunting moose with a bow and I kept going, holy crap, that is so scary. Mm-hmm. I mean, like roll up in a ball going, oh my dude, they're so close. They're so, so big, so big. There's part of me that, that goes, do you, do you have enough balls to do this? Mm-hmm. And I wanted to find out. I'm like, I wanted to push myself to go, do, do, do you have enough courage to go stand there with a stick and a string 15 yards from this 2,000 pound animal? Yeah. And it's funny, like after doing it, because my wife's first question was, were you scared? Because I shoot this big bull at 15 yards. And I said, in and of the moment, no. Did you guys call that bull in? Yeah. So he's, he, he was, <laughs> that's intimidating, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's got his eyes rolled, but well, here was the worst part. So we're going up, we're in a John boat going up a river uh-huh. and I'm in the front of the boat looking for tracks or looking for sign. And we'd been in the boat for four or five hours. And then I finally saw tracks coming out and I, Hey, it got tracked. He went over and looked, said it's a big bull, beached the boat, go up into some kind of vegetation. It was about this high, kind of little red berries in there. And as we're just kind of standing there listening for the bull, I look down and at my feet, there is a pile of poop with steam coming up (laughs) off of it. I mean, (laughs) steam is coming off. And I look at the guide and I go, moose. And he goes, Grizzly. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so there's grizzly with steam coming off of it, which means he ain't far away. And then and then the and now we're now we've got a moose coming and I forget about the grizzly. But and the and he's coming in to fight. He destroys a ten uh-huh. foot tree. I mean, down to nothing. He wants to fight and 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 he, but he's kind of hanging up at like 15 yards because he can't see us. And, and in and of the moment, I was not scared. And I thought, oh, I'd be petrified. Mm-hmm. My only thought was turn so I can get a stick in you. I need, I need a, an ethical, I mean, I need a shot. I need, and it was so hyper focused on what do I have to do to get an arrow in this? And and he finally turned to walk off and I look and there's a, there's a hole and I'm, so I go to full draw and I wait till he fills the hole and I shoot him. He goes 30 yards and, and folds up. As soon as that happens, 
now I've got then the adrenaline you. and I'm, I'm doing the stanky leg and shaking and all. But in the moment, I wasn't scared. And I didn't know that about myself. Yeah, I got you. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You didn't freeze up. You didn't turn around and run away. You held it together. I didn't know that about myself. Do you, uh, are, are you into bows? Do you just go to the bow shop and be like, get me set up and I want to shoot no, good? No, I'm, I'm like do, a, do, do I'm wrench like a on weird your own stuff? dude. I like, um, so I was hunting with a Matthews for a while and, and I liked it. And, but then I got a PSC bow that just seemed to fit me. Like mm. when I went to full draw, I wasn't, it wasn't jumping on me. I could hold it. I could draw it straight back. I've hunted with the same bow for eight years. You did? Oh, yeah? yeah. You're not a new and bow so I'm not a guy? Ju- I'm not a junkie on anything. If I get a truck I like, I'm like, eh, I don't need a new truck. I, it's Look at the watch I'm wearing. I mean, I've... I've done okay in life. I'm wearing a hundred dollar <laughs> watch with a broken band, you know, yeah. cause it tells time. Well, I'm not a latest and greatest thing kind of guy. Yeah. I just found a bow that I liked. I'm like, I like this one. I'm going to stick with this. one. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned hunting arrowheads. What was your introduction to that? Um, I had found one or two, I think as a kid, but Glenn, my farm manager had looked for him his whole life. Mm-hmm. And I'd go to his house and look at his collection. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Well, and I think becoming a bow hunter is you start to go, damn, these people. Oh. These people were pretty so you fascinating. So you were looking at it, too, from a hunting perspective. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of guys that are into arrowheads that don't look at it from a hunting perspective, which always kind of surprised me. Man. I'm fascinated by everything they do. Like, they took rocks, and they learned to make a knife. They learned to make a projectile point. They learned to make... Uh, a grinder, a bowl and a grinder to let's mash up acorns or corn or, or whatever. They were such capable people. So when I look at artifacts, I'm, I'm thinking, A, if I pick it up and go, all right, I'm the first mm-hmm. human being in 7,000 years to hold this. But mostly I think about there was some woman or some man sitting here making this, not thinking – oh, this is pretty, or this is artistic, they're thinking, I need to carve up that squirrel tonight for dinner. They were making it to live. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's what got me kind of fascinated with it. And uh, the first trip I ever went on, Glenn took me on a trip up to North Carolina. He had a buddy that was planting strawberries. Yeah, because you guys will... Oh, we'll go everywhere. Yeah, you'll travel. You'll go like on a hunting trip. Yeah. But to go, if you get an opportunity to go look somewhere. Like, I just did a thing for uh, Wounded Warriors out in Texas. Well, I knew I was going to be out there, and I called a friend that was close by. I go, hey, you got any buddies at Arrowhead Hunt? Oh, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I got a friend that loves it. And I'm like, find out if we can go with him. So I fly out there and do something good, do the Wounded Warrior show. They raised like a million bucks. It was cool. But then the next morning, we're out looking for Arrowheads. So try to combine them together now. Mm-hmm. And then... uh you have a lot of stuff from this property you were showing me. Yeah, but we don't, is, I don't. I don't mean to criticize it, but you even said it too. It's like it's ugly. It's ugly, but it's ugly because of uh, they didn't have they didn't have rock to work. They didn't have flint. They they had quartz, which is very hard to make thin yeah. and pretty. It was functional, but they just don't make pretty arrowheads. But like I made friends in Arkansas that have beautiful flint. I made friends in Texas that have beautiful flint. I have friends in Kentucky. So, hell, we'll get in the car and drive to Kentucky if somebody says, I've got a plowed field and it's rained. Oh, yeah. What were you mentioning? You, you were going where someone was putting in strawberries? Yeah. And so they had plowed this field, and it was going to rain. You and, need, and they were fixing to plant it. Yeah. They're fixing but they hadn't planted it yet. But they plowed it. But when you plow it, it's kind of dusty and you can't really see anything. So you need it to rain Mm -hmm. a time or two. But the guy said, he said, y'all better be up here in the morning or the meth heads will kill it. Because the meth heads will go out there and look for airheads and sell them. God, that's my kind of meth head, man. Yeah. I never heard of that before. Dude, you can go up there. It can rain that night and you can be there at sunrise and the field is covered in footprints. (laughs) And you're like, how is this humanly possible? <laughs> how do you do this? Um, and so the first place I ever went with him, I'd walk 
30 feet from the truck and I saw some, thought it was a piece off a tractor, like a spark plug, picked it up. I'm looking around. They had broken pottery and things. And as I'm doing it, I'm like, that doesn't feel like plastic. And it's a pipe. You know, it's so funny. I know it's because you were, you were, when you're doing that, like how when you're looking on the ground, you'll sometimes hold something in yeah, your hand you and just kind of like, worry it in your I, hand. I, yeah, <laughs> I worry it. That's great because i am always got something in my hand. Even Whatever the I'm most gonna, interesting thing. Yeah, like, oh, that's a cool rock. You walk around with it in your hand. Yeah, you twirl know. it in your thumb. Yeah, so, uh, and I'm like, crap, that's not a tractor part. That's a pipe. It was a stone pipe. And I go over to Glenn, who's been looking for 30 years. And I go, dude, look what I found. He was so pissed. He turned around and walked straight away from me. Didn't talk to me the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then I was hooked. If you ever do go do Rogan show, you should bring that pipe and let him, uh, let him pull a rip, <laughs> let him pull a rip off that pipe, man. He'd probably get a real kick out of well, that. Yeah. Native American. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Right. <laughs> He'd probably love to put that. Pipe yeah. in use. So, uh, how much time you spend hunting now? Like you get some time out now, right? Yeah, I get some time out. You know, I'm kind of weird. Like I just had a friend that went to Africa. Have you done because that? Because I've been to Africa, but not to hunt. Uh-huh. I've been to Africa like six times. I'd like to do it, but I, I'm kind of weird. Like he wanted to go hunt a leopard. I have mm-hmm. no desire. I don't, I don't want to shoot something I'm not going to eat. Mm-hmm. I don't, I, and and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just this is me. This is what you I, this like. Is, I, this is the way I'm weird. There's some guys that have foot fetishes. Yeah. Right. And I'm and I look at them and go, Have you seen boobs? Because they're <laughs> they're not bad either. You know. But uh, <laughs> I mean, but to each is well. The, here's the thing about the foot fetish too. <laughs> what he views as lingerie, I call a flip flop. Right. I mean, (laughs) but so when I say that, I'm not being critical of somebody that wants to hunt a leopard. That's just the way I'm wired. Yeah. Um, is if I shoot something, I want to eat it. So, but I would like to go, I'd like to go to Africa and, and, and bow hunt. And I, and we, and I still hunt with a gun. Like I just got, Oh, you do. Yeah. Well, I thought maybe you gave it all up for your bow. Big game, I hunt with a bow, but oh, like, I like I just got turned on to duck hunting. I oh. had my neck fused 10 years ago, and the doctor said two things. Don't look up and don't shoot a shotgun. That rules out duck hunting. Well, apparently not, because I tried it, and just I lean, liked it, and, and, and now I'm like, <laughs> I'll I'll deal with the pain, because this is a lot of fun. Well, what's uh, in your head, is there like a... How, like how do you how do you tell when you've scratched the itch for a year right like for me i'll if there's i like to hunt turkeys a lot okay so late may whatever i'll be in my head i don't think of how many turkeys i got i don't think of how many days i hunted turkeys i think of like well how many successful hunts was i in on yeah meaning my kid got one my buddy got one like that, I was. You don't present. have to shoot it. Yeah, I could yeah. shoot none of them. It wouldn't yeah. matter. And if I finish the spring, and I was like, "Man, I was in on six turkey kills." That's pretty good. Then I'll be like, "Oh, that was a pretty good spring." Yeah, you know. Um, when the big game season ends, when it's all said and done, I'll kind of look at was there one particular? Did I get some particular animal that I was real excited about? And do I have a whole mountain of stuff stored up in freezers? Yeah. And if, if it's check, I'm good. You know, how, how do you, how do you well, know, how do you know that your hunting life is well, good? Well, I think we go through stages as a hunter. First, it's, I want to shoot a deer. Mm. Now I want to shoot a deer with horns. Now I want to shoot a deer with bigger horns. Now I want to shoot a really big deer. And so I've been through all those stages. Yep. Now I'm like you. If I can take a kid who's never done it and introduce it to him, that's, every bit as rewarding as shooting a deer like that. I think that's the thing I loved about bow hunting uh, and kind of that conversion on big game stuff was I had shot a lot of big deer with a shot. And there's your, might be a redneck word. Shot and shot. And I'd shot in a lot of, yeah, the guy that didn't like uh, 
crescendo. Cres- he's, got crescendo. he's got a real problem. He's got real problems with shot. Um, <laughs> he's not even know where to start when he writes that letter. But, but like when you were gun hunting, and you'd go, "Hey, there's a deer. There's a, oh crap, it's a doe." Mm. When you're bow hunting, you're like, "Oh hell, here comes a doe." <laughs> you know, everything's in play. Everything is in play. And and I like that about it because it's hard, man. It's hard to get a stick. I mean, you got to let them get. And and a friend of mine who loves big bucks, he said, "Well, what do you do if you're bow hunting and the buck comes out at a hundred yards mm-hmm. across the field?" And I said, "He wins today." Yeah. But now I know a way that he where he likes to cross, and I'm going to move my stand closer. Yeah. yeah. But he wins today. And you're excited about having a grandkid. Oh, yeah. Oh, the greatest joy of my life. Honest to God. I You get to the point where you think you've kind of got life figured out. Uh-huh. I had no idea I was going to love a grandkid this much. And I got a buddy that's got a new grandkid. He told me he likes that grandkid better than he ever liked any of his kids. Oh, I, told, I tell my kids. <laughs> I, t- I, I hold my grandson, and I go, I love you. And I would lay down my life for you. I would die for you, but I do not love you as much as I love him. I, 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 I don't love my wife as much as I love him. He is my favorite human being of all time. Well, and I had all girls, and I love being girls. I love being a girl yeah, what, dad. What was that track record? You, you, of three? Yeah, everybody in my family had girls. We had 11 girls in a row. He's the first boy in 58 years. Like you and your, you have you, two siblings, and you guys yeah, spun everybody, off 11 yeah, women. Yeah, yeah, and no, no boys. So he's the first boy, and like yesterday morning, he comes out in his pajamas. He's pulling on his green rubber boots. He's got his thumb in his mouth. He goes, Jex, let's go ride a tractor. And I'm like, hell yeah, let's go ride a tractor. And <laughs> I let him drive the truck. I let him sit in my lap, lap and drive. He's two and a half. That's fine. Uh, man. Yeah, but God, he's, I, I, every, whatever bad I ever did, he makes up for. Uh, i got a great life, you know? Sure. Is, I've I've made a fabulous living doing something I would have done for free, because I love what I do. I love I love that comedy. It's 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 very rewarding. There's you're making people laugh. Um, it's it's like the release valve that keeps people's boiler from exploding. You're, mm-hmm. um, but it's not easy. I love the fact that you never get you never get it figured out. After 40 years, you would think I would know what people are going to laugh at and what they're not going to. I still don't know. She's like, it's like the the woman you can't figure out. Mm-hmm. But that's what keeps her interesting is I can't figure out. Because after 40 years, I can go up there and go, hey, is this funny? And it's crickets. Nothing. And you're like, wow, really? It's mm-hmm. not funny? Uh, so I, I have that as a career. I have a farm, which... I love, man. I don't need I don't need shiny cars. I don't need I love this. I love I love being able to grow my own food. I love being able to hunt my own food. I love being able to share a sunrise, you know, with friends of mine. And I've never spent one day in the woods where I went, crap, that wasn't worth it. Mhm. Cuz you always see something. See yeah. a hawk catch a squirrel or, you know, like today, you and I stop and there's two otters chasing fish. That was the highlight like, of my day, man. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, crap, that was cool. Yeah. There's always something like that. So I've got a farm. I've got a great job. I've got a, a wife that I adore, been married for 40 years, got grandkids. I got kids I adore. I'm like, I don't know what I did, but thank you. I mean, we've got a great life. Well, thank you. For coming on the show, man. I do. Thank I do. I do. I'm, I'm fascinated by you. I, I like what you do, and I like that you humanize hunters. You know, it's like I was doing something in L.A., and they were, you you know, you, you guys just shoot everything you see. I said, are you kidding me? I said, during the course of a deer season, I will see 400 deer. I might shoot four does and a buck. Mm-hmm. I said, and you tell me you love them. You don't love them more than I do because I'm out on a bulldozer creating habitat for them. I'm out burning yeah. to to give them more native food. I'm out. Don't tell me you love them more than I no, do. No, you could say to them, said, 
if you don't think I love deer, I'd like to take you for a little drive. Yeah. <laughs> right. But what I want is as many as my land can hold uh, with them being healthy. I want it right there to the top. But it's it's not an infinite number of deer. So, and I've seen chronic wasting disease. I've seen it's when nature takes care of it, it's ugly. Much more humane. And I don't, sh- and I'm not shooting them. It's not the killing. It's every one of them, somebody eats. It's, it's a food source, you know, so, and if you don't like it, that's okay. I don't have to like everything you do, but I like the fact that you show that, you know. Oh, thank you. It just, you, you don't have to like it, but I do. And it's legal and it's, it's good. It's fascinating. It's the biggest classroom in the world is the outdoors. Yep. Well, man, thanks for um, thanks for being a hunter. Thanks for making everybody laugh, and making everyone laugh without capitalizing on uh, hate and discord, but just laughing at yourselves, man. Yeah, laughing well, at ourselves. And I and yourself. I think we've yeah. kind of forgotten how to do this. Mm-hmm. Is is right now in society, people are people have to be right, which means you have to be wrong which means we're not going to have conversation because I'm not going to get engage in a conversation where I have to be wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and we need to give up our need to be right. Because what you find as you age is things that you argued vehemently for as you were 20. Now I find myself argued vehemently against, mm-hmm. I'm like, you, you, you learn and you know, we're all wrong about something. We're, the truth is we're all wrong about a lot of things, but we have to engage in those conversations. So like with you, I want to know what you know that I don't know. Mm-hmm. Those are the conversations I like to have. Uh, I think a way to describe aging, one way to describe aging would be it's a process by which you become less and less interested in your own opinion. Agreed. Yeah. I, I, I told my kids, I said, I miss my 30-year-old body, but I wouldn't trade my 60-year-old mind and soul to get it back. Because mm-hmm. you realize so many things you wanted to fight about when you're young, you get old and like, eh, it ain't worth it. It'll, it'll sort itself out. Half the things you worry about, more than half, 90% of the things you worry about, they never happen. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of, there is a wisdom that comes, and, and that wisdom comes with everything's not a confrontation. You and I, here, here's the thing. I think politically you, you can have two people on total opposite ends of the spectrum, but if you sat them down and you said, what do you want out of life? What do you, what do you care about? What do you love? We would agree on 85% of the same things. Mm-hmm. We all want to be able to take care of our family. We, we want to be able to take care of our kids. We want them to live in a safe place. We want to have food in our stomach. That 15% would be different. What we should celebrate is that 85% that we're alike. You and I grew up in different parts of the country, different ways. But as we sit here and talk, we realize, oh, Steve and I are a lot alike on this. And mm-hmm. the parts that are different, that's what makes you, Steve, and what, makes me Jeff. But what we want to do it, right now is we want to fight and scream and yell at each other about the 15% instead of going, crap, it's 85%. You and I want the same thing. Mm. Why, why don't we, uh, why don't we base in that? We can talk about the other, but how boring would it be if we all wanted and thought alike, you know? Yeah. Crap, that would be, that's one of the things I love about nature is, and if you don't have faith, I don't care, I do, but I sit there and go, God's infinitely creative. Like there's thousands of different kinds of trees. If you ask me to come up with trees after four, I'm like, I'm, I'm out of ideas. You're like, I'm going to, I'm going to do a little one, a medium and a big yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm done. I'm done. Or, you know, types of things in the ocean. Uh, man, there's a fish, you know, and you go, crap, how many different kinds of fish are there? Well, for people that love the outdoors, it's always, that's what I mean. It's kind of a, it's a classroom. Mm-hmm. You're like, all of this works together. 
you know, as the squirrels sitting there chewing on the pine cone, some of those kernels are going down and into the soil and becoming pine trees. Well, there's, you know, within a square foot of dirt, there's 40,000 organisms living in that. And they all do something. These these leaves above it that are decaying are feeding something that feeds something else. And it's all tied together. And it's way more brilliant and smarter than I have the comp- the the ability to understand. So I'm just going to sit here and soak it all in and go, mm-hmm. wow, isn't that cool? It's a great place to do that and experience that. And the thing that you were getting at a minute ago about uh, that 85, 15%. 85% of stuff brings us together. 15% yeah. is different. There's been a like this idea I've been toying around in my head about when I, and I've talked about this a number of times, is I compare sometimes my lived experience, right? Like what happens to me going about my day, going to a gas station down the road from here, whatever. What happens going about my day? And then me reading about what my American life is supposed to be like. Yeah. And in reading about what my American life is supposed to be like, it's supposed to be defined by um, polarization, political violence, right? Yeah. Whatever. All of this economic strain, social and economic upheaval, you know? And, and I'm like, oh, okay, I got it. That's what life's like. But why is that not line up at all? With what you're experiencing. With what happens when I'm like talking to my neighbors I, who I don't know the first thing about where they're at politically. Or why does that not happen when I go into a gas station? Why are people cool? When I get into an Uber, why am I able to, you know what I mean? Like, how am I supposed to be having this, but instead I'm having this? Well, and, and which ones of those things, which of those do you believe? Which is the truth? I, I'm leaning toward thinking that the lived one is the truth. It is the truth. You, know? <laughs> you follow me? I've got to the point I say when I walk on stage. I, I, and I do, as I'm standing on the sides of the, of the stage, I remind myself that everybody that I'm going to look at is going through some kind of a struggle. Now, it might be a physical struggle. It might be emotional. It, it might be financial. But they're going through something. And that's why, really, I, my whole life, I'm like, just have grace with people because you don't know their backstory. You don't know what they're going through. So... Have a little grace with them. Uh, and I think that's that's the cool thing about laughter is, you know, we're, we're all in a struggle. That's why I love what I do is I can go visit kids in the hospital and they might have my book or they might have my game or they might have my DVD and they didn't know I was coming. So there's something that I've mm. created that has given them an escape from the struggle that they're going through. And I went, oh, that's kind of a cool benefit to this. But yeah, we don't we don't give each other much grace. You know, you don't know. Like I worked it up, it totally under the radar. Didn't want anybody to know. But get up every week, and I worked down at a homeless shelter in downtown Atlanta uh, for twelve years. Get up on Tuesday morning at five o'clock, go down there and work. And my opinion of of homeless used to be like, oh, you're too lazy to work or you're, but well, most of them were in some kind of addiction. But if you learn their story, if you come to, to learn their story, something bad happened to them. Mm. They were molested. They were abused. They were. And so the addiction wasn't really the problem that that was the symptom. That was, I got to numb this painful feeling. And then you start having grace with them going, Crap, dude, I would have numb too. Um, we need to get back as as a as a society to start doing that with each other. Uh, having some grace. So quit yelling. Life's too short. Mm-hmm. Crack some jokes instead. Yeah. Fry up some venison. <laughs> Fry up some venison, crack some jokes. If you don't want to eat the venison, fine. Hand it to me. I'll eat it. <laughs> well, man, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Well, and I, thanks for the tour of the place. Yeah. I've always been such an admirer of what you do. Oh, so you, man. it's I'm honored that you would be here, that you would take the time to be here. Oh, no. Once I realized you weren't going to come to me, I, was, I decided to come to you. Yeah, so. so suck it, Rogan. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Not right. really. I, I love what he does too. But, All right. Thanks a lot, man. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Come back and hunt and fish. I will. I'll okay. bring my kids. Yeah. Please bring your kids. <laughs> All right. That'd be the number one reason. You guys could stay here and break everything in here. Great. That's what, what it's for. Thank you. <laughs>